Hi there, is this Tim? Yes. Hey, this is Eli. I, I'm the one you called at the Kingdom Hall here. Um, I looked into uh, the reasons that I heard from Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, uh, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong to clarify if my memory is is right here. Um, okay. What they're telling me is that, like, uh, the, the Trinity they believe originates with the first Nicene Creed or Council created by um, the pagan emperor Constantine, who uh, unified Rome politically through civil war, but he still faced a division in its religion. Right. Uh, when I look into uh, church history in the first 500 years, though, I find um, before the Council of Nicaea, I find in 186 AD that Tertullian of Carthage, he was a lawyer trained in Roman law. Uh, he was converted, it looks like, I think in the apostolic time, he defended the Trinity against Sibelius, who was uh, spreading modalism. And so I, I also kind of took a look into modalism, and it turns out there's uh, modalism here in my local community. There's a church here. of the It's the UPC, the United Pentecostal Church. They're uh, modalists. I, I don't know if you're familiar with modalism. Not really. I mean, I'm familiar with Pentecostals, but I don't know what modalism means exactly. Uh, yeah, it's a little different for me, too. It goes way back. Um, it's uh, the belief that God is one uh, being and one person and that he operates in different modes in history. Like, for instance, in the Old Testament, he would he would be 100 percent the father in the New Testament. He would be. 100% the Son, and then in the church age, he would be 100% the Holy Spirit. He, It's almost like he's uh, wearing different hats, different stages in history. Hmm. So then, and then by the time of the Nicene Creed, I seem to recall that there was kind of two factions. There's, there was like the, um, the uh, well, I think one of them was called the Arians, wow, and yeah. one of them was called the... I forget the other one, but one, but there was kind of, yeah, yeah. So I mean, those ideas existed at at uh, yeah before that time. That's right. But that, then sort of the Christendom as we know it today sort of was shaped by that because they sort of had to pick where, which it was uh, Arius of Alexandria, and then uh, the other uh, the person who was defending against Arianism, the Trin Trinitarian position was. Um, uh, the uh, Athanasius. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, you're right. Neither one of these guys were the first ones to hold those positions, but right. it, you know, like Arius really kind of spread hit that theological position. He would, he, he, it's in his name because he really brought it to the forefront more than anyone else. And also Athanasius was not the only one defending Trinitarianism, but he came to the forefront at this point in history uh, in the division that was existing there. But those were not the only two positions that were uh, necessarily uh, up for grabs. I mean, modalism was still there. Uh, in fact, none of the um, theological positions that were that arose and that were defended against have ever completely gone away, it turns out. Hmm. So have you, have you then seen, well, I guess in the scriptures when, you know, you mentioned about the apostolic time about, um, well, I guess like in, so there's a, there's a verse in first Thessalonians that, uh, or maybe it's, I guess I'd have to find it real quick here. Um, I think it's in verse, let's see, it would be, I guess it would be chapter or second Thessalonians chapter two. Um, and verse, well, the very beginning of chapter two, um, it, it says in like verse two, not to be quickly shaken from your reason. Um, and then kind of in verse three, it says, let no one lead you astray be, in any way, because it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Okay. Uh, so, so that idea, like, is kind of a theme throughout all of the, the Greek scriptures or, you know, some called you know the new testament that that there would be 
basically the teaching that was given to them by Jesus, um, but that they were constantly being reminded to hold fast to that because there would be plenty of other teachings that would come up in the in the years to follow, which sounds like kind of what you're describing, all these different versions of, you know, ideas, philosophies, and so forth that people have to to explain the scriptures. Yes. Yes, indeed. So, so that would be kind of the way we understand that to have come about, is that there would be an apostasy following the death of the apostles. Yes. And so... So what what would the Bible have meant, or what would those teachings have been meant to uh, explain in the first place? You know, how would people have taken Jesus' teachings or the apostles' teachings in the first century? Uh, that would be that's that's our authority on 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 those things. The way that I've kind of dealt with that issue is um, Jude one three. Uh, Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered uh, to the saints or to the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, that message, as I've investigated uh, the scriptures, looks to be Second uh, Corinthians, or I'm sorry, First Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, verses one through eight. Um, also, that's like there's First Peter three fifteen that admonishes us to always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have to anyone that would ask. Again, mm -hmm. I, I, for that part, I refer to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Uh, Paul's giving there a truth statement, which is meant to be challenged as to whether or not it's a historical event. And uh, it, for me, it's the foundation of my faith in uh in those eight uh, verses, that's what I have seen the historical faith as being as, as far as um, like the faith that I have today is based on uh, those passages. I can go there real fast. That, that wasn't where I was intending to go originally, but I can just go there real quick. In first Corinthians 15. Uh, yeah, one one through eight. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know what translation I've got here. I don't have an internet connection at the moment, so I'll uh, I'll read it in this real fast. It's uh, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again <clears throat> the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen <clears throat> of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James. Then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So for me, I take uh, Jude 1, 3, and 4, well, 1, 3 specifically, to be this message in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, that's once and for all delivered to the saints. Do you feel then that um, does that scripture there indicate to you uh, something about the identity then of, of Christ as to whether he was God or not? Um, not so much there. Uh, I just, <clears throat> I was thinking off the top of my head. Uh, I, I think I would say that that in a sense would be a co-text to Luke 24. It looks like verse... Um, Seven, where Jesus is speaking, uh, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So it seems right. Jesus is talking about that already to the disciples, and then Paul's giving an account of it after the fact 
as a historical event. <laughs> because I understand where Jehovah's Witnesses are coming from in seeing uh, the Council of Nicaea as an origin of the Trinity, although I find the Trinity defended in 186 AD by Tertullian, um, <clears throat> I can kind of see where their argument's coming from there because <clears throat> uh, uh, Constantine was making it, you know, really uh, the state uh, religion and <clears throat> kind of mandating that you must be uh, Trinitarian. And uh, I mean, not everyone was, there were still Arians and things, but um, I, it's, uh, I've I've read the Athanasian Creed too, and uh, Athanasius, you know, he. Well, actually, I don't think the Athanasian Creed was written by Athanasius, but it's in his name, and in that, uh, it condemns somebody if they don't believe in the Trinity of not being saved. Uh, I don't know that I agree with that 100%. Um, if somebody doesn't understand the Trinity yet, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they would be held under that, but also. Um, more importantly for me is whether or not uh, there's a Trinitarian nature of God revealed scripturally. I think that's far more important than a political issue uh, that took place really with um, a new emperor and, and the state church. Uh, I think more importantly is, is, what, is whether or not scripture reveals it. Um, yeah, I would agree with you. For sure. Uh, what I have here is uh, some scriptures that I feel may lean in that direction. These are scriptures that pertain to the resurrection of Jesus Christ after he's been raised from the dead. Okay. Uh, the first one is Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. Uh-huh. Uh, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of a spirit who lives in you. So this sounds like to me that the Holy Spirit took part in raising Christ. Okay. Would, we, would we agree there? Mm, the spirit. I can't see why not. I mean, basically the way... Uh, the way we understand the Holy Spirit as being God's active force, basically the means by which he uh, does anything, essentially. Um, so anything that you can um, attribute to God, you can basically attribute to the, the Holy Spirit uh, being not a separate entity, but being His the means by which he accomplishes what he does, basically. And obviously it says right there that the spirit, um, you know, it's mentioned in the verse. And so, uh, but that that would be kind of the way, yeah, the way uh, I read that. I have some scriptures on that. I had compiled just a, a some for kind of the person work of the Holy Spirit as well, uh, because I, I kind of, I had gotten from Jehovah's Witnesses that <clears throat> it was, uh, an active force, like maybe impersonal. Uh-huh. Uh I have I have some scriptures for that for me are the reasons that I would see the whole that I do see the Holy Spirit as a person. Um Acts five, three and four. Uh then Peter said, you know, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. So in Acts chapter 5, 3, and 4, it seems to be saying that lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. Um. And then Acts 28, verses 26 and 27, uh, they disagreed, or I'm sorry, 25 through 27. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, 
and as you if you continue to read that um what paul is actually repeating there is from isaiah 6 8 but he isaiah paul, 6 8 you said yeah now paul says it was the holy spirit that spoke um <clears throat> In Isaiah 6, 8, Isaiah says that it's Jehovah who spoke, that it's God. Now, I I would be very reticent to say that Paul made a mistake. He's really the greatest theologian ever to live. I don't mm-hmm. think he would be in error when, he, when he's saying this. He, can, you, can you remind me the verse where Paul said that? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Acts chapter 28. Verses 25 through 27. Got it. Paul says it's the Holy Spirit who spoke, but then in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. So Isaiah is saying that it's God, and then Paul is saying that it's the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got Second Corinthians three seventeen. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then really to give a strong testimony to the person of the Holy Spirit would be Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord, <clears throat> while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, "Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them." So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Here, in this in these passages, it has the Holy Spirit uh, speaking in uh, first person, identifying Himself. Uh, did you say Acts 17, 1 through 3? Uh, 13. Oh, that would explain why I'm confused. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You you probably said it right. I'm just... Oh, wait. Up. I'm sorry. Before that was Second Corinthians three 17. I'll go slower so that you can go no, with no. me. I, I didn't I know. Here. I'm looking I, them up as we go here. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to go. I'll, I'll wait for you on that. I'll, I'll take more time. I didn't. I didn't know if you'd wanted to go to those with me or not. Yeah, I'm just I'm making notes here because ultimately, you know, I I, I like uh, I like the questions and I I like doing research on this stuff, um, but it's not all, you know, things that um, that I'm basically prepared to talk about right off the top of my head. So I'd like to uh, so I'm making notes here so that I can do some more research on this. Scriptures you mentioned so far about the spirit, um, there's definitely some some thoughts that uh, come to mind or verses that. I think helped me kind of um, put those into, um, or I guess, yeah, into context or whatever. And I'd, I'd have to look them up. Um, I don't want to kind of shoot from the hip here. Um, were there others that you were thinking about too? Uh, I think I have just one more, which would be John 14 verses 15 through 17. Uh, this would be Jesus himself speaking. Uh If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Uh, Here Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit uh, as he, rather than it. I guess seems more sure personal um, uh seems to identify him gives the holy spirit kind of person mhm yeah 14 15 through 17 yeah okay um well so what do you say do you mind if I do a little bit of kind of uh studying on this and then get back to you yeah that'd be uh fantastic i have just um 
just a couple of scriptures. Uh, I had started with um, that Romans eight eleven through thirteen, uh-huh. where it it's saying that the Spirit. I mean, I, to me, uh, what I'm seeing is that it's saying the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Uh-huh. I also have Galatians one one, uh, which is I believe from Paul Paul's writing. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So that one is seems to be saying that the Father raised Christ from the dead. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I, I have Ephesians one seventeen through 20. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms. So that one again seems to be saying that the Father raised Christ from the dead. And right. um I have only just a couple more. Um Acts two twenty four. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So that one again, that one kind of has generically uh, God there. I don't know if yours has Jehovah in Acts 2.24. Uh, let me look it up. Okay. 24, I was making a little note there. So it says God resurrected him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. And then I've got uh, kind of two areas in the Gospel of John. Um Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'll I'll still wait though. If you're, are you uh, looking that up? Uh, I'm I'm caught up. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, I've got John two nineteen through twenty one. Okay. Uh, Jesus answered them, "Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days." They replied, "It has taken forty six years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days." But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Right. It sounds here like Jesus is talking about raising his own body from the dead. But there's another passage in the Gospel of John uh, where he talks about that again, it seems. It's um, John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Okay, 10, 17, and 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Okay. Yeah, which, um, let's see. There's a. I see a cross reference here that goes to uh, scripture and acts. Is that one that we looked at already? Yeah, it is two twenty four. Um, thought it looked familiar. And oh, which tra- which translation are you reading from? Uh, NIV. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, we did go uh, that. Yeah, Acts two twenty four. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I guess for me, um, with John chapter 2, 19 through 21, with John 10, 17, and 18, it sounds like strong language from Jesus about uh, raising his body from the dead. Mm-hmm. I mean, two nineteen through 21, he's saying that, uh, you know, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Mm-hmm. And, and the temple he's, yeah. he's talking about is his is his body. Yeah, that's that's what I'm seeing there. Yeah. So it's look, 
with with these scriptures, it it sounds to me strongly like it's te- the scriptures testifying to uh, three persons taking part in the resurrection of the body of Christ. Yeah. So, so like I say, there's a few things that kind of popped in my head about that, and I'd like to be able to do the same as you're doing and make some some references. Yeah. Uh, to share. Uh, 